Initially, when I started working as a researcher, studying women's movement and studying different struggles associated with women's rights, um, I was looking at domestic violence, particularly from the lens of policy perspective and how uh, the enactment came into action, such as the Domestic Violence Prevention and Protection Act of 2010, and what went behind the adoption. Um, so much focus was rather given what went behind the scenes while adopting a law and then how the implementation came in the field level. Fast forward to COVID, um, much of global discussions were centered around uh, the probable increase of domestic violence worldwide. It was also declared as the shadow pandemic, and we from Brack Institute of Governance conducted a media tracking exercise trying to understand the impact of uh, COVID on domestic violence survivors. Um, but then, uh, well, well as, as there was a surge of news reports all around global media, uh, we thought that, okay, let's go to the field, let's talk to the survivors, and we were um, commissioned by the rule of law program of, by GIZ Bangladesh uh, to, to have uh, a research on uh, domestic violence survivors' access to justice uh, during the COVID pandemic. And that is when we went to the field, we talked to the survivors, their families, uh, the relevant stakeholders who were you know, associated with survivors' justice journeys, and we, we got an overall good picture of what was actually happening in the ground level. We found uh, physical abuse that we know about mostly, but we also found psychological abuse and economic abuse as well. And the psychological abuse is very, un uh, it's not talked about that much, but we saw a prevalence of it in all forms of abuse, it's, be it like verbal abuse or uh, uh, physical abuse, but uh, the psychological abuse was associated with that as well. And in terms of uh, financial abuse, uh, it can be classified or we saw that it can, can, can come in forms of uh, controlling of financial, uh, the woman's financial expenses, expenditures and earnings and whatnot, and also uh, not providing financial support to the woman and children as well. So, well, there, there are many, uh, many factors actually. It, it could start with uh, lack of access to resources, uh, financial constraints, uh, lack of access to information, um, um, also lack of legal knowledge. Uh, it's, it's actually many folds. Um, and particularly during COVID-19, we saw that you know families were going through financial distress. There was also uh, 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 tensions with uh, loss of employment. All those added in uh, you know greater disadvantages for families who were already poverty struck. Um, so that was quite challenging for survivors coming from certain backgrounds to, you know, actually uh, report violence incidences. And often it is seen that uh, survivors kind of endure violence to, to extreme levels. They, they, it's considered domestic violence is actually considered to be a form of violence, which is, which is rather kept within the four walls of, of a family because it is considered to be paribarik. It's a paribaric incident, huh? uh, uh, domestic. Uh, so before seeking help, uh, e even from immediate family members, they try to cope up with the violence as much as possible. And then when it kind of exceeds um, all forms of severity maybe, then they uh, try and seek redress. But even it's seen that uh, even if they're trying to seek redress, uh, uh, complaints that have um, you know grievous injuries in terms of physical violence that are given much more importance than, you know, let's say uh, psychological violence or let's say uh, a, a slap or just verbal abuse. That's, that's not considered uh, uh, to be matters that are taken under consideration as seriously as opposed to other forms. Like what makes them vulnerable is the acknowledgement of the violence itself. That when they're facing, for example, verbal abuse, it can be perceived very normal that, okay, uh, I was verbally abused or uh, I was uh, insulted. Uh, uh, the lack of acknowledgement of the violence itself and the different forms of violence that, okay, if I'm be being beaten up, that's when I'm facing domestic violence, but there are different dimensions to it as well. I think uh, the uh, not knowing all these diff different dimensions are also making them vulnerable to facing further violence.
what I learned is this different form that prevailed for it. Uh, most importantly, the psychological violence that a uh, woman face. And it can be in different forms. It can be the stress. It can be not having the money to support the family. So I think uh, the mass prevalence of the psychological abuse and the lack of acknowledgement is what I what struck me the most. Um, for me, it was uh, it was very moving to see uh, the constant efforts of survivors to put up with the violence just for the sake of saving their marriages. Uh, uh, they would uh, stay up with their in-laws, put up with their in-laws, put up with their families, uh, put up with financial abuse, uh, all forms of physical abuse, uh, violence at any cost. But at the end of the day, all mattered for them was the shongshar, their shajano shongshar, the, the family that they belong to, their marital home, uh, uh, and their children, and having having the security to keep their children with them as uh, as besides to their husbands as well. Uh, so. That, that that kind of brought questions amongst ourselves. We were questioning ourselves that was our idea of justice different from their idea of justice? What we might be calling justice, uh, for, if, we, if we were thinking that it's better to leave a home if an abusive husband, an abusive family, um, was that actually not their idea? They they rather preferred that they'll put up with the violence and they'll they stay in the family and they and they'll have a secure future. So, uh, yeah, um, I think that was very very new for us to to understand that concepts of justice are very much varied among survivors and among researchers or any person working in development sector. Well, adding to their concept of justice, what also struck me was that. They don't want their husband to be punished, but they want the violence to stop. Even though um, what happened to her was unfair and the husband or there were other perpetrators, but punishment as a form of justice was not uh, was not the primary uh, focus or what they wanted. Firstly, uh, domestic violence is an emergency. Even it should be treated as an emergency, even during uh, crisis situations like the COVID pandemic. Uh, provisions should be made available, they should be more accessible, it, you know, starting from medical services, starting from, um, uh, you know, legal services, counseling services, shelter homes, everything needs to be there uh, at, at a continuous basis and uh, they're, they're highly essential and should be treated as an emergency. So this is first. And secondly, is that we often um, forget the psychological trauma uh, that could be uh, that could result from keeping up or putting up with violence for so long. So another aspect would be to, you know, provide mental health support and psychosocial uh, support to survivors of violence, so that and not only to survivors of violence, actually to their family members who who are also equally part of this justice journey. Um, and as well as to some extent to perpetrators even, um, uh, just just to take an holistic approach in addressing um, addressing the mental trauma that the violence caused.